Okay, the record is started. Yeah, so, for some reason, whenever this email came through, it didn't come through as a calendar invite. I had to, to schedule that one separately. So I don't know if that's a... May uh, so someone may not receive it? Yeah, yeah, it was a little tricky to get on the calendar. Ah, yeah, may, maybe because it was, uh, even for me, it was tricky to book a Zoom room here at Eletra. But uh, I, I already posted a link on also on the mailing list, so probably you will see someone else. And this is a Christmas Christmas week, so yeah. That's true. Yeah, I don't know if we're gonna have the full participation today. That's yes, okay. at least at least I have a reply from Carly, and mm -hmm. she hopes to to participate a, a bit, but later probably next year. Okay. Yeah. And that, uh, yeah, sorry, was that in response to the email that I sent? Uh, she responded on the email I sent. Maybe I don't know if she placed it to you in CC. Okay. Yes. Yes, she did. She placed it you and uh, Chris. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Then I saw that. Yeah. Okay. So it's five minutes and I uh, probably we could start. Let's do. Yeah, that okay. works. Okay. So just uh, for the uh, for the agenda, uh, let's see for uh, workgroup tooling. Uh, let me please share my screen. Or maybe you want to share your screen for the slide. Yeah, I can do that real quick. Yes, uh, so uh, please. Okay. All righty. And I'm actually going to go ahead and put the meeting link notes in chat. So for anybody who needs them, this is where you can find them. And if you go down to uh, 12, 12, 23 in the agenda, I have linked the slide for working group tooling. Um, so yeah, to Andre's point on the agenda, the first thing that we probably need to do as a working group is think about getting organized more from a structural and project management standpoint. So I put a little bit of time, uh, I guess, two weeks ago or maybe a week ago into thinking what shared tooling could actually look like for this particular team. Um, in most instances, I would probably just suggest tools, um, but for this particular group, as I think some of these artifacts can help us onboard people a little further down the road, I put some extra time in um, mapping some of the mission and sought outcomes in addition to the objectives and the proposed artifacts from the perspective over to required capabilities and finally map that to proposed tools. Um, so what you're looking at right now, this orange box, is a mapping of the exact tools I think we probably need as a working group to be able to function together, um, in addition to where individual capabilities would fit on different tools. So it would be seven different things, uh, Google Groups mostly for administrative work and operational um, and then uh, non-development project management. Uh, actually, that one should be down on Mattermost. I switched those two. Um, Mattermost or Slack for async communication, Drive for technical documentation, inventory, just kind of general knowledge management, uh, GitHub and Gitbook for code and uh, more technical documentation then a website, YouTube, and a publication for a lot of the external content, meeting archives, PR and comms, things like that. So that is the gist of what we're looking at for the work group tooling selection. Um, does anyone have thoughts on platforms that they think would either better satisfy these capabilities or that they would prefer to use based on what's actually here? 
Ah, okay. Uh, just just a sec. I saw the message from Berend. Mm. Yeah, so she, uh, he has a clash with so, another meeting. Can you hear me or not? Yes, yes, uh, we can hear you. Sorry, there was a mix-up in my agenda, so I didn't get the note, but I saw it in my mail. Um, but I need to give a short presentation in another room here, uh, Eric yeah. Note, in the, uh, in the GoFair office. I will be back later, so I'll leave it on, but don't expect uh, any disturbance or... Uh, comments for me now uh, but i will watch the recording later okay and yes, maybe sir. i will join you before the end of the meeting thanks okay. Baron. thanks Baron. okay thanks all righty um yeah. yeah i think a lot of people had that problem um so we can think about the way that we schedule zoom calls a little bit more in the future but that's okay this is the christmas edition anyway so i don't think we we're going to get that much participation three days before everyone goes offline Um, yeah. So yeah, does anyone have strong thoughts about these seven tools right here? Um, may I? Uh, then for Google Group, for Google Group, uh, well, I can agree, but I don't know if uh, any one of us is familiar with Google Groups. So uh, I don't know how, uh, let's say, how easy it would be for our people to work with it. I guess for me it will be it will be fine. It would be quite feasible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and well, and really, it's just a way for us to manage the email list so that whenever someone replies, all it goes to everyone instead of constantly having people coming on and off of the the group itself. That's really the gist. Yeah. Anyhow, I am I am on it. I am on it. If we will have a. Uh, Google Group, it will be it will be extremely fine. And uh, this for the second point, uh, let's say I much more agreed on Mattermost because I had uh, practically not a lot but uh, experience even in administration of Mattermost, and uh, it seems yeah. for me a more feasible solution than Slack. Okay. Despite Yes, despite some one of us may be more familiar uh, with Slack, but now even the mobile application of Mattermost is mature enough to stay stay with us and uh, give us a good uh, user experience. I am for Mattermost. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so but I think I have one never other used thing. It. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I I have never used Mattermost, but I use Slack every day. So, in comparison, are, are there big differences? They're relatively similar platforms. I can show you the Mattermost for the GoFair Foundation if it would be helpful, because I think I actually have that one pulled up already. It's a, a Slack-like application, uh, but the difference is you can host the server more easily yourself. So if you take a look here, this is Mattermost for the GoFair Foundation's fellowship program, um, and it's just a look at you know comment threads. Uh, they've got some boards that you can use for very basic product management style work, um, and then a couple different playbooks for onboarding. It's nothing particularly complicated. It's a async communication platform. Um, the big thing is you store and own your own data. But one point to uh, mention on that. So we could. Uh, it, a part of this is hosting. Um, do we want to host Mattermost and own our own data? That's about $10 per user per month. Uh, the DSI Foundation already has a Slack that we can use, and they're willing to support that cost. And uh, I think it's $8 per user per month um, as an alternate option if somebody wants to self-host and is willing to take on the requirements and the cost of doing so. They're more than welcome to, but the DSI Foundation has offered up their Slack for free. Yeah, so it's uh, yes, it's a Slack-like uh, solution. It it doesn't seem too complicated in comparison with Slack. It's it's very similar. And uh, about the other points uh, here, 
I am uh, I am completely agree because all of them would be really really feasible. Okay, cool. Um, then that works. So the other thing to mention on this tooling, um, probably best for us to get a Google group set up immediately. Um, Mattermost as well, and Google Drive for knowledge management and some of the technical communications. I think I'm yes. glad to work with the DSI Foundation on getting these three hosted. Um, for the other aspects, I think there are other parts of this call that we need to work through, namely a vision statement. And over time, we probably need to work on aligning towards an architecture. So for GitHub in technical project management, if you want to use the nodes.dsci.com, uh, it's open. Uh, once again, the DSI Foundation and DSI Labs would love to have collaboration on that. Um, but this is something that probably needs more group alignment before it actually moves in that particular manner. Um, so yeah, I'll, if everyone's okay with this, do we have any preference on the free Slack versus the paid matter most? That is the one big question at the moment that's still on my mind. Everything else is more or less a free tool. Well, uh, about about matter most, uh... I could uh, I could even uh, even su even suggest if uh, we can host the free version of Mattermost by ourselves because I have two servers and uh, I can easily install it. Okay, yeah, that works. Then will you take over the requirement of uh, hosting Mattermost? Uh, yes, I have a four uh, four cord server. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the space I have only probably will only affect the amount of data I could contribute to IPFS, but it doesn't matter. So I can uh, put just the Mattermost in free edition of my own server and okay. set up the open open authorization. So we can do it using our Google accounts or seed or something like. Okay. Yeah, that's. Perfect. How much storage space is on the servers, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, well, now let uh, I can check, but it's around uh, 200 gigabytes. And I can okay. increase it. Okay. Okay. Um, that should be enough for us to start with, probably. Yes, we will, we will not see the see the huge data, data sets to share. I don't plan on flooding the server with data immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, that works. Um, uh, then yeah, you'll take over Mattermost. I'll set up the Google Group and the Google Drive. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we we uh, have have we decided that uh, we will use uh, the free version of Mattermost on on my server, or we will use uh, the paid one? Would we say that uh, uh, the paid software as a service? Why don't we start with your server? We'll see how it goes. If it's free. If we run into a bunch of uptime issues or hit data limits very quickly, then we can look at switching over either to a paid version. Okay. Or okay. Plan. Then, then I will deploy it on my own server. Cool. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Um, and yeah, I think that in terms of the agenda and notes from this call yeah. was the big thing um, for Eric to make. Um, and then matter most on Andre's server. Okay. Um, what, one question. So yes. uh, I see Notion has been brought up in the chat. Yes, by Slava. Uh, I'm wondering where do we store the artifacts around the project management itself? Should that be on Notion? Should like we have things like contributor guideline, here's the project management information, here like the, the history of all the different uh, YouTube recordings that we have regarding to the project. Here's where you can find the artifacts. Like, should we use Notion perhaps as a uh, aggregation hub? We can do, we can do. I'm not so familiar with Notion, but uh, we can do. What do you think? It's a good platform. It really is. Um, if we, uh, the only thing is we have Google Drive, but I'm actually more, familiar and comfortable with Notion. Um, I can quickly share my screen if you want to see it. Um, yes, please, me, if you yeah. can. Yeah, I have way, way drastically too many applications. Uh, let me stop share, and then I will start this. So yeah, here we go. I think this one is, here's a communal writing page 
that I worked on a while ago. <clears throat> so it's a, a pretty basic, um, I guess, writing platform. It's fairly versatile. So you would have the ability to put in backslash, create a bulleted list, make a table, ask AI to write something for you. Um, whenever you make new pages, it lets you format them as databases. You can tag people, add folks. Um, it's more or less just a, a customizable um, knowledge management system. Yeah, for me, for me, it's uh, nothing difficult, and uh, I guess it's really a, seems a good platform. All right, we can use cool. it. Cool. All righty. Well, I will add that in. So let me uh, put another comment on here and um, Notion as well. All right. Cool. Then those are the eight. Um, I can work on standing these up as a default. I'll put them through the DSI Foundation. So with that being said, are we okay to move on to the next point? Yes. Yes, we can uh, trans transit to the next point. Uh, so do you have, uh, any one of us, do, do we have an idea about the vision and scope of the project and how it should be written? Yeah, so maybe as a start, we just quickly look at the prospectus that we have. Yes. Um, so I think while it's not a vision statement per se, it's at the very least a start to a vision statement. Um, let me see. Prospectus. So I'll link that here and quickly paste it in chat. Um, yeah, so I put this together, uh, I guess, two weeks ago. It's a relatively simple document which starts out with a one pager on why DPID matters. The gist is we need scalable persistent identifier infrastructure to be able to create a truly machine actionable scientific record. Um, then outline sought outcomes, one potential avenue for the group to go through. Um, and finally, objectives and artifacts. So based on the sought outcomes, what objectives should the groups strive for and what artifacts are going to be needed to make that. Um, so for these three sought outcomes, um, I can quickly just go through them to give an overview of what we're looking at here. Um, first outcome, a very, very simple proof of concept. Um, and I guess, this was kind of my way of thinking about it. I'm definitely open to how others would feel about this particular direction, but I want to showcase a world where institutions can host their own data in data publishing. Publishers can surface it and still function as kind of the discoverability hub, but we don't need a complex web of APIs connecting all of these different groups to each other. Data publishing can be made simple without having to remove the canonical version of a data set from an institutional server. That's what I was envisioning showcasing with this proof of concept, data sovereignty, essentially. Um, so it would be something relatively simple. Um, I think I put a link to the exact details of what I would propose in that. So it's the idea of uh, late spring, early summer, get a couple institutions together, everyone hosts a fragment of a data set, nobody hosts the whole thing, it gets surfaced by an interface which doesn't store, and there are no APIs in place. Um, so that would be the first sought outcome. The second would be kind of publicizing that as best as we can. So finding different forums to talk about a success story between five to 10 different institutions and how they collaborated, why it matters, launching that eventually into coordinated proposal submissions. As I know we have a lot of folks who have put different ideas forward to this group. And it gets to be a very complex landscape 
of potential avenues for us to pursue that derails conversation and kind of sidetracks things on uh, different ways that we can go, which is good. And it's amazing that we have so many ideas and so much interest for potential proposals. But I would say that we put them into a coordinated submission pipeline where we can help folks in the group actually get funding for building research on the, or for doing research on the decentralized web and decentralized persistent identifiers. Then finally, third, um, so difference between a working group and a, a community of practice. A working group is going to be more action oriented, more detail oriented. A community of practice is going to be more support oriented. What I would love to see coming out of this group is a knowledge hub, a communications hub, a place where anyone who's interested in working on these topics can go to and feel like they have a foundation to launch off in their own direction from. Um, this is how I started thinking about potential, I guess, direction for this particular group. But I want to hear other people's thoughts, as this is just one possible way to go. Slava, I see where you raised your hand here. Yeah, okay, uh, so uh, yeah, yeah I, I will I will uh, introduce myself. So um, Slava Tikhanov from Dance, uh, this institution from Netherlands, and uh, we are part of uh, Dutch Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences. And I'm senior R&D engineer and um, active contributor to Dataverse. You know, there is a uh, Harvard Dataverse uh, data repository hosted by Harvard, but it's been uh, now like, like uh, standard uh, in Europe also. So we did localization and uh, we contributed uh, semantic web functionality in uh, Dataverse. So uh, question that I immediately have. So I have some experience with decentralized identifiers and we're using for some projects in, in the academy and uh, you are I think talking about getting uh, decentralized identifiers assigned to data, right? Or to metadata. It's not yeah, clear. Could, yeah. So like, um, so you could, you could think about it this way. So we use a lot of the tooling that has been originally built around DIDs and we repurpose some of this tooling as a, uh, some of that technology in those protocols to create persistent identifiers for research objects broadly defined. Right, broadly defined. So it can be a data set, can be a publication, can mm -hmm. be all any type of artifacts, right? And what's important, like the the essentially we we every um research object broadly defined that's posted on the network is signed by a DID key, right? So okay. that's really like the, the idea. But uh and, and the DPID schema itself has a DID resolution method, right? So it does mm -hmm. conform with the DID schema, but it's it's not indexing anything that has to do with identity, right? It's there to index things that have to do with research objects, right? So it has different okay. properties. So essentially you could think, if you think of a Venn diagram with overlap, so like uh, the, the DID spec is one part of the DPID, right? Okay. DPID is a broader concept. So basically you want to build a search graph out of it, if I understand correctly. Yeah, so like we can build a graph of digitally signed entities um, research objects, right? And essentially we can have uh, an interesting property, which is deterministic resolution to the mapped resources using these DPIDs. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, how about performance? Uh, performance uh, at which level for data retrieval? Yeah. Yeah. So like essentially it, it really depends on the number of network participants and the proximity of the network participant to the uh, requester of that data and the performance of their server and their broad broadband connections, right? So there's a lot of like different factors that play into the performance. Uh, how we handle it, um, we have, um, we essentially run a node and that mm -hmm. node, uh, that IPFS nodes uh, essentially is, 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 is going to be very fast because we run it, right? But we cannot guarantee that other participants running nodes in that network can provide high levels of performance, right? So it could be that you're in a case where you have low performing nodes that impede the retrievability of data. Um, but I do think what's important here is, is to, to essentially think about how you monitor the performance of the network, right? So like, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, that's a big conversation, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, performance, um, it'll, it depends, right? That's the, that's the simple answer to it. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I was asking about... 
I was asking this question because I think performances also should be kind of uh, put on agenda. Yeah, oh, definitely. I'm I'm all for performance. <laughs> and I love to hear your background, by the way. I'm a big fan of the Harvard Dataverse. I'm also a fan of the, uh, um, um, what's its name, the Software Heritage Foundation, right? What mm -hmm. they've done. Um, and what we're essentially thinking out. So like a lot of this project has uh, been inspired quite a long time ago by what the Software Foundation is doing because they proposed, you know, to store uh, research artifacts as Merkle DAX, right? That was mm -hmm. like one of the first archives to propose that, right? And so like we were thinking, okay, well, that's a really interesting idea. And now we have a tool stack and actually a network stack that allows us to distribute Merkle DAX over that network, right? Mm -hmm. So that's essentially IPFS in a sense, right? And, and these underlying technologies. And where it becomes really interesting is when you add DIDs into the mix, right? So now you can have digitally signed entities as Merkle DAX on an open network. And so you could think about that as a fully peer-to-peer -peer interoperable network of repositories, right? That have built in ability to communicate and migrate data between themselves, right? Yeah, just to make it even more interesting, so we implemented a kind of prototype uh, for Dataverse to support the IDs. So it's kind of working. However, it's not sus really sustainable. So I think performance after you will get uh, hundreds of uh, millions of uh, DIDs assigned uh, will go down. So definitely. So, <laughs> no, I'm pretty serious because I, I actually uh, did that. I, okay. I, put, I put inside a lot of objects. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So yeah. sorry, sorry, go ahead, please. So what I envisioned uh, for Dataverse, because we have more than 100 uh, data repositories uh, distributed worldwide. So I really wanted them to, to run uh, JD um, uh, as a kind of com uh, extendable component that if you want to assign DI, you can still go for DI. And uh, if you want uh, JD, you should be able to, you should be able to switch uh, in collections. And, uh, well, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about that. I mean, that's fascinating because I think we're, we're, we we have a lot of alignments in what we've been trying to do. We're just coming at it from a different angle. Um, and concerning the performance uh, issues, I'm very happy to add, uh, but this does extend a little bit more uh, mm -hmm. compared to the initial scope, but like, I'm very happy to add like simulations, right? Where we have a million entities how efficiently can we query these entities? What are the retrieval times? You know, we can we can actually test a lot of the uh, um, we can we can do some stress testing, right, and report those results as an artifact, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things we could do. But this is thing. why why I was was asking if we are going to assign uh, uh, DIDs for metadata or data because there is a big difference. So for metadata, I believe it's possible, it's feasible. So we can put the whole data landscape inside. Well. More or less uh, reasonable with reasonable uh, performance, but not with data. Like we are also working with controller categories, and uh, we try to assign uh, for every concept to make it kind of persistent and sustainable to assign a, a specific DID. And this is really tough job to to make it working. You know. <laughs> But okay, that, that's great. I, we have a lot of valuable experience to share with each other. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what we need right now, it's a, a good proliferation of a, a distributed hash table. So the more IPFS nodes we would have, it is better. It's better to have. So just just in advance, I will contribute with two, two of my nodes. So I will put the node, the peer IDs for them in the nodes of uh, this of this conference. And uh, you can do if uh, some if some one of us is running his own IPFS node, we can put the peer IDs and to contribute with uh, with space and with the performance. Yeah, so I, I think that's a good way of like testing, doing like the additional proof of concept. I just wanted to 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 say that once we get a stable solution working with this group and we build something that's really really good. Uh, we can go to protocol apps who are uh, close allies to us, right? The inventors of IPFS. We know them very, very well. And once this works, uh, we can expect a lot of uptake from the IPFS community and from the data storage communities around them, right? So uh, I, I just want to preface this, right? So like, I think there's the proof of concept where we can experiment, you know, within that limited scope based on what Eric and you have, have set out. And then at some point when we reach maturity, 
because Protocol Lab and the people that have made IPFS, they need this, right? This is the most beautiful and perfect use case for the technology that they've built, right? And it's not just them, right? There's a lot of additional technological layers that have been on, built on top that would really, really benefit from what we're creating here. So once we get it going, and once it's good, um, I, I, you know, I put my hand over fire that we will get a lot of uptake within these communities. Yeah. Uh, just just a sec to return a bit uh, to the to our agenda to vision and scope. At first, I would say that uh, Eric, you said really an important thing that the participant should own and have a sovereignty uh, over uh, his data. And I think it's uh, just the most important thing we should uh, mention in our vision statement. But uh, there is also a thing that we should mention, I guess, uh, is that anyone could participate in the storage of the and of the existing data sets. And uh, our system, well, in ideal situation, would be reliable enough to see the users contributing with the space, even without uh, knowing what the data they are storing. So it should be possible, but it should not, should not be mandatory. I think we could, uh, uh, we cannot hear you, Eric. You are muted. Okay, so really leaning into that open participation aspect where someone really can just donate an IPFS node to the scientific record. If you've got a server with two terabytes of storage and you don't necessarily care exactly which data set you store, it can be yeah. made easy for that to happen. So securing the scientific record. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so like, I, I don't know if this is in scope or out of scope of the specific working group, but we have a couple of design properties and um, um, goals and how we how we design our network. If I can, I can, I'll copy paste them and we can sift through them. I think there's a lot more that what we're trying to do than just the, 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 the DPI itself. So some of these might be out of scope. So I just want to preface that. Yes, that uh, it's, it is better to, it is better to have a copy paste and uh, we will just harmonize it. Yeah, let me do that. Um, Eric, where is this document? Is it? Uh, is, it's not the first yeah, one. This is it you in Telegram? Uh, let me. You have Telegram open? Yes, I do. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Uh, and just for clarification, uh, is service uh, is the case where you are signing the ID to service? Is it in scope or out of scope? Mm, so, sorry, can you repeat? I was doing something. So, else. so uh, in in usual situation, you are signing a DID to uh, some uh, data or metadata, right? Uh, this uh, to research object, and there is also possibility, and it's in the spec that you can assign DID to uh, some service. So you can use kind of the way to uh, authenticate in a secure way and to access some service. And is it also inside of uh, So you're, you're talking about uh, assigning a DID to a service, for example, right. and yeah. a meta curator, metadata curator. Right? Yeah. So it, it can give you a lot of um, advances also, advantages, because, for example, if you have some, some uh, service dealing with sensitive data, you can use it as a kind of the authorization layer. So you'll uh, you just transmit keys, and after you'll be able to resolve, uh, identify to get data from it. This is very interesting. We haven't uh, really thought about assigning or essentially having DID assignments to services, and I really welcome inputs in that matter. I, I think this is the most interesting part of DIDs. Yes, I agree. I agree because we already discussed it in the terms of prefixes and yeah. the assignment of the prefixes and the web depths of trust over over the existing networks because i think it's quite uh it's quite important so about one year ago more or less i did presentation on this and uh, i think i have it I, I i have it on my slides just give me a second yes if uh, you would share it it will be really interesting Oh, you are using LaTeX to formulate your... Yes, sorry a, about that. But, no. it, but it is slides or it's just a document? 
Oh, it's a latex document. Ah, okay. So th these are these are some of the. Um, but this could, this is beyond scope, I think, of the DPID working group. But just to give you an idea uh, where how we're thinking about it, right? Yes. So I think it's important to um, just maybe align on this a second. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So um, yeah, so it must be as easy as possible to create, find, and retrieve entities stored on this network. Right, that goes into performance, right, and security of retrieving the entity, meaning that when I want a specific entity, I do get the entity I'm looking for. Uh, versionable and modular should be as easy to update and fork these entities, right? Um, versionability should be a first class citizen of the research object itself. So, it's really, like, this is a big, big problem in the current scholarly communication infrastructure, and especially for data sets and code. Uh, provenance for every operations on the network, an immutable log of who, what, and when needs to be preserved and made accessible. So this is like the DID signature scheme that we implement. Uh, programmable access, not all data should or can be openly accessible. The network, network most allows for, for both open and restricted data access and negotiations around that. Um, permissionless, anyone should be able to create an entity on the network, uh, fork a research object, or enrich uh, the metadata schema in any way that they feel uh, is good. The moment we have provenance on that, um, this is very, very good because then uh, application developers portals, they can filter based on the provenance that have a good reputation for adding and enriching valuable data sets. Uh, open source and decentralized, we need to be able to allow for distribution of the data uh, to create resiliency and its underlying code base should be fully open source to improve collaborative improvement and stewardship over time and reproducibility and verifiability. Uh, the protocol must allow for linkage of research artifacts, such as code, models, data, publications, into connected entities that enable verifiability and minimize fragmentation, right? Because fragmentation is a big problem right now. So linking these entities. So these are just like some broad, uh, you know, internal principles that we've set for ourselves. And I would say what is missing is management of uh, private keys. Because this is, I mean, when you're generating a million of uh, DIDs, you'll definitely will face a problem that for every DID, there is separate private key that should be managed separately. And as soon as you will uh, keep it, it's okay. But, but it's, if you lost, lost something, uh, you'll be not able to access it and, and change it. So this okay. is kind of yeah. issue also that you should put how to manage this. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would not put like this is not, I, I totally agree with you. This is like the the harsh reality of the of the of the of the actual implementation experience, right? Um, these are just not this just not doesn't feel like this high you know vision principle. But at the end, it's like the pragmatic requirement, right? You need that. You need that in place, and it needs to work, right? Yes, yes. It's important thing because not so many or even organizations are building and are willing to build their own infrastructure to manage private keys. For example, Eletra does not, just because uh, we don't have enough, uh, even the competences to manage it properly because it's a difficult problem. Yeah, no, I understand that. Um, so the way we've been doing it now in a prototype implementation is that for every researcher that logs in the system with their ORCID ID, we generate, right? So we generate a key for them, right? And, and using MPC, multi-party computation, so it's 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 very secure and we don't know the key and they have a path to retrieving that key. And then what we're experimenting now and talking with the ORCID folks is that every scientist in ORCID should have like DID publishing credentials, right? And so they have a DID publishing credential in their ORCID profile recorded. And for them, it's completely painless because for most of what they see and what they know and what they feel, that they they essentially are not they, they almost need to do nothing just need to log in with orchid right yeah they, as a as a uh, um th this is our response to do it as quick and efficiently bootstrapping off an existing identity network right because that's really important like bootstrapping this uh, pki networks in the absence of a pre-existing identity community is a very difficult task so we want to be able to tag along existing pid providers and essentially provide a a what you could call as like a, a like a transitionary solution, right? In a sense. Uh, yes, yes, really. And uh, well, for me, it seems a good idea to yield for the uh, private key management uh, for, uh, let's say, the for establishment time of the infrastructure to the service like uh, OrSeed, because uh, yes, it is reliable. 
and the bespoke technology which is underlying or see the probably i i'd never heard about it uh, to be hacked or to be to be leaked so it seems secure i definitely think it's an important point right understanding how we assign keys to existing identity communities so that it's a seamless transition for them is very important yes yes and also it uh, well, for sure for future but it would require from us to include also the private keys managed for example by ror as an organization registry but well for the proof of concept it means nothing now we should just totally agree with you. RR is another um, organization for that that we want to onboard ultimately. But uh, I think the one that is most actionable is Orchid right now. Yeah, yeah. Also, this oh. is uh, also because it's just most popular. Oh, Berend is connected. Welcome back. Welcome back. Yes, welcome back. So, Baren, as we're closing out this point on the call. Our goal was to make a vision statement. So we're now at least a page into that. So that's, that's a, a good start, which will eventually need to be consolidated. Do you have any advice for making a vision statement as a part of a group? Yes, to I close out this point? Actually, a very specific advice. Uh, the reason I had to pop out is to present to the biosemantics group on the Lawrence conference that we will have in January, 10 years of FAIR. It's actually called the road to fair and equitable science. I think either Eric, you will be there, or Philip, or uh, no, th there are people. At least Design Labs is one of the uh, participants. Now, and but we also have fifty-five people from around the world. Uh, Christine Chichester, uh, Christine Kirkpatrick will be there. Carol Goebel, those kind of things, including George Strong, the founder of the internet. So it will be fifty-five people meeting for the whole week and discussing all the challenges ahead of us for the coming decade of FAIR. And of course, the whole GUPRI PID assignment is, is a key issue that will be on the table there. So what we decided is to have a Google document up, hopefully by the end of this week, on each day. First day is a reflection, a nice movie, how FAIR spread around the world, blah, blah, blah. Then day two, is on fair digital objects and machine readability and machine actionability. Well, very close to your heart. Day three, the Wednesday, is on equitable access for pharma, for people from the South. We will have the directors of the open science clouds from Africa, Malaysia, China, whatever, uh, joining. And then the last day is on fully AI ready. And that is how to tame the crazy LLMs, uh, you know, to, to deal with uh, the JGPDs of this world and keep them from hallucinating. And uh, I think that what we do is in that roadmap document, to which at least Eric will have access, but I'm discussing broader access, before the meeting, which is 22 to 26th of January, we want people that come to the meeting to contribute to the document. And if they want to present something, it's not guaranteed that we have a lot of presentations. It's not about sending, but about blending, as we say. So we ask them to make a short video, five to 10 minutes, about their tool, their approach, their idea, whatever. So Simon Hodgson will talk about World Fair, you know, uh, frontiers about their new data publishing initiative, da 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 da. These videos will be linked from the document and published in the GoFair YouTube channel so that everyone <clears throat> can watch the videos before the meeting already and also the document, comment on it. So you guys could make your mission statement and put your issue into the document via Eric and then make a video if you want. That doesn't necessarily mean you get a presentation at the meeting itself because we mainly want to do breakouts and discussions and work on the roadmap and consolidate it uh, and on friday that will be presented to about a hundred people including publishers so there you will have the elsevier's and the wileys as well you will have policymakers and funders up to a hundred people that are then presented with the roadmap 
And hopefully we already get some commitments for funding certain outstanding issues that need to be urgently addressed in the fair realm in the coming decade. So uh, yeah, if you make a, a vision statement and you sum summarize that briefly in a text blurb that you can link to the document and you can also make a video, then people that come to the Lawrence conference will be able to watch it and it makes your case. Okay, we will most certainly do every single thing that you just said because okay. that sounds amazing. So a text so blur and a video to be added. Yeah, so yes, I'll, I made the document according to the days. It's already uh, almost there. Eric, uh, our Eric Schultes is now looking at it. And I told him just this morning that my ambition is to have the document up by the end of the week. I still have no consensus yet with Eric because it simply came up in the other meeting now that the whole biosemantics group, my own group, wants access to the document. But you don't want hundreds of people looking at the document. So essentially, it's restricted to participants, but that includes Eric. So if and you shouldn't all start, you know, shooting on the document, but also uh, people from the GoFair offices will be there. So there's plenty of ways to get your points into that roadmap document. Okay, yeah. we will make sure that it gets added. And thank you, Barnd. So just just work on your statement, and by the time you're done and you have it ready, and you maybe want to make a short video with a few slides, you link it to the roadmap document. Okay, Chris, yeah. this may be one where we want to pull in uh, some of the protocol labs folks and get more professional videography and really spruce that up if at all possible. Yeah. Um, maybe the two of us can spend some time thinking through both. Uh, or specifically the copy for the video and what we would want as a storyboard and an outline there. Sure. Sounds like a plan. Thank, Thank you, Baron. Great this. idea, Thank as you, always. Any other questions? <laughs> I think that's perfect. Okay. Can, I, can I ask a naive question? How is it related to LM hallucinations? Oh, how I think about that? Yeah. Okay, I wrote an article, a short article about that, that I can send to you. Uh, mm -hmm. If you send me an email, Eric, then to remind me, I'll send the article. But the essence of it is that in LIFES, this institute that we are setting up, we will have three kinds of data, that is real world observations in hospitals and so on, experimental data and established knowledge, which is in our case, mostly the Uritos graph. And we will, feed, uh, we will use LLMs only to, uh, regardless of what they are trained on, I mean, be careful there because you could get a big copyright problem on your mm -hmm. neck, use it. But uh, we will feed it with triples okay. and constrain it by a conceptual model. So does it come with crap like a protein can make a protein complex with a disease? Mm -hmm. And then we will have also conceptual models to filter it, even maybe with a, a slider that gives you more or less constraints, because if you constrain the model too much, you only get known stuff. While if you relax the uh, constraints by conceptual modeling, you may get uh, hypotheses that make sense. Okay. And even have with Uritos, the idea that they have a graph that is built on 275 databases and heavily curated. You probably know them. Um, one of the things they will do in LIFES, if you type, let's say, a drug and a disease in your mm -hmm. retos that have no co-occurrence in the entire graph, so also not in the literature, it can automatically create with LLMs, with very much constraint, a full article to describe how likely that hypothesis is that this side effect would be related to that drug. So that's the sort of ambitions we have with FAIR. So we use LLMs, but only for very restricted purposes and strongly restricted for a number of reasons, not only hallucination. Mm -hmm. You would be astonished when you know the ecological footprint of just using it randomly for every crazy thing. Uh, so we 
will only use it when it's unavoidable and to create beautiful text with very good instructions, no hallucinations allowed, and driven by proper high quality data. Okay, so uh, you are going to use uh, knowledge graph basically to fine tune LM. Is yes, correct? but also the conceptual models, which are also in the okay. knowledge graph, to constrain that they don't say, oh, a surgeon can also transplant his own liver. That, that kind of crap that's coming out now. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm the co-founder of the gene ontology, according to the last version of ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. Totally crazy. And it's hidden behind a lot of stuff and between a lot of stuff that's true about me. And Giancarlo from Twente, he analyzed that if he would have written go fair as one word instead of two words, this would not have happened. Because it simply sees GO, which is the acronym of gene ontology. It knows by my papers I'm a geneticist. Go is mentioned all the time with my name, which is Go Pair, but what does the stupid machine know? So it makes me a, a, a co founder of the gene ontology. That's a typical hallucination that's sort of dangerous. Not that the gene ontology founders would now suddenly hate me, but I have to correct it. And, and it's a waste of time. So be careful is my advice with LLMs in general. The last reason is that under the hood, I know that I know, I shouldn't say I know. My strong suspicion is that one of the reasons Sam Altman was fired and then hired again uh, was that he promised people to support them if they got a multi million dollar lawsuit uh, because they had used an illegal model that was fed on copyrighted material without permission. Mm -hmm. There's a big legislation fight going on there that's worth billions. So be please, please be careful with randomly using LLMs. And, and also be critical. Eh? Did you read that the whole presentation of Gemini was partly doctored and now they've done it without all the editing of Google and it is not at all better than JetGPT, even worse, I think. So mm -hmm. all these, there is this huge marketing war going on, trying to scare us all as if we are close to sentience now. It's total crap. It's pure, stupid pattern recognition and statistically putting the most likely word next. That's all it is. So far. And, okay. and I would, I'm, I'm extremely skeptical about it. But for stupid work, it's very good. Writing a very dry scientific text based on triples, top. I will never write another article again. Uh, by the way, do you know that triples you are describing, they are already collected uh, by Harvard University in Indra project? Yeah. But, well, okay, good. And the University of Washington is using them to train LM. So we will work together wherever we can. Uh, but uh, I am, of course, one of the skeptics. So Eric, you send me an email, a one-liner. I'll send you the little article I wrote about it, where we also make the distinction between established knowledge, uh, real-world observations, and experimental data. Because by combining those, you can make an enormous jump forward. If you have a hypothesis based on established knowledge, and you, you know, check immediately whether you find that pattern in real-world observations, for example, in my field in the hospitals, that's extremely powerful. So don't mix those two, otherwise you hallucinate to the moon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. We'll send you an email around that. Um, so we're coming to the end of this call. I can actually stay long. I don't know if anyone else can, because we made it through uh, one and a half points of this. <laughs> well, well, me too, <laughs> me too. Be yeah, me too, because I visited the uh, Zoom room for uh, 30 minutes after. So uh, okay. we can uh, actually we can uh, we leave for the next uh, next call the points from the uh, possible entry points to find funding. But now I received a message from Georgos, uh, Georgos Kurusias, who is um, actually kindly asking us to uh, let's say suspend a bit the dissemination of the prospectus. Uh, okay. Yes, just uh, until probably until Christmas, because on next uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, he wants to add some suggestions. 
And okay, he, so who's this, by the way? Uh, he's a, a data. Um, he's a head of the scientific computing group of Eletra, my colleague, and uh, he's very, very experienced. You can see on his uh, ORCID record. Uh, he's very, very experienced in the data curation, and uh, as he is one of the heads of our, our uh, of our beam lines, so he's curating a lot of data. Okay. And he uh, worked with me on an expanse project, so I guess uh, he will he will place a lot of good suggestions for us for the prospectus. That would be incredible. Yeah, we can. I, I don't think it's been widely disseminated. We've sent it to a couple folks who can provide feedback, but it's still early stages. Yeah, we can suspend that. Um, another thing that I want to put on here, but we can probably do this async, would be uh, dissemination planning for the prospectus. Um, okay. Uh, I have already the starting of dissemination of the prospectus on oh. the agenda before. Sorry. <laughs> No, you're 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 ahead of me. That's fantastic. Um, so we will. I'll just put a quick comment here around uh, ask to wait. Let's see below. All right. Um, for the FDO summit abstract, um, as the next point. Well, before we shift off of the vision and scope as a part of the prospectus. Um, Andre, would you be able to take a first pass at a quick vision statement over the course of this week? Maybe what is what sounds right? Two, three sentences. Yes, yes, I will be able because I will. Uh, I plan to go for uh, smart working some some days, maybe one or two days this this week. So yeah. I can participate in the creating of a vision statement, and then next uh, in the, at first RD, RDA uh, blog post. And mm -hmm. also uh, FDO abstract. So yeah. what? Uh, well, I just wanted to ask uh, if uh, would would you expect from me that I will uh, come for a first pass on both RDA post and uh, FDO abstract? Or uh, no, the I FDO need... abstract is on me. Okay. Um, I I know the direction that I'm going with it. I just hit writer's block over the weekend. Um, so the two ways that I'd like to go. <clears throat> First off, it's the idea of deterministic resolution as opposed to consistent resolution in persistent identifier systems through IPFS. I think that's a very strong point that needs to be reiterated. And then second, this paper that uh, Dr. Pruchard put in the email thread is a fantastic overview of the FDO space. So one of the things that was in this particular paper um, was an overview of the FAIR digital object documentation standards. Um, so I want to try and figure out how deterministic resolution fits into at least one, if not multiple, of these points around next steps for FDO. So that's how I'm thinking about this conference abstract, um, but I'm open to suggestions there. And I'm also putting out a warning that I really did hit writer's block this weekend. So if I need some help, I'll reach out. Yeah, so uh, would you plan to share it via Google Documents so we could place uh, yeah, questions and that. suggestions? Yeah? yeah, I can do that. Great. So uh, I so will, you know, sorry? I have something here. Can you send me this article, the link to this article? And because I didn't read it yet. Um, yeah. And also, um, the the link to the Google Doc that you have for this meeting, so that I if I I won't disturb anything, but I could make some comments maybe on the doc. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, I'll send them to Skype work. Yeah. Okay. Cool. You got it. Hey, I have to leave then, but I'm glad I could join at least a little bit, and I am uh, very excited about this movement. So uh, all the best and success. Thanks, Baron. Thank, Thank you, you Baron. Bye. Yeah. Uh, 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 okay, so does that general direction make sense for the FDO forum abstract? Deterministic resolution tied into next steps for FDO as identified by Carol Goebel. So what I like about that is that it's very scoped. And yep. I think um, we need scoping for this. This is a little bit also my comment when I added the points on the vision statement. I'm saying this is larger than just DPID and deterministic resolution, right? 
So I just want to make sure that perhaps the vision statement around the DPID working group is let's build scalable, powerful technology that gives us deterministic resolutions of PIDs, right? Perhaps that's it, right? right? Yes, and, right. Then, and then all of the broader things that uh, I guess Slava is also super interested with me, you know, <laughs> it's kind of the questions, right, around DIDs and their interactions and open collaborations and open annotation of metadata. I, th I think all of these things uh, perhaps should be or would be like outside the scope, right? It, it's just part of a broader uh, um, a, a broader goal internal to the group, you know, but it's 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 like we keep the FDO part around that very, very closely scoped idea of deterministic resolution. And that's the wedge that uh, provides us uh, with really interesting discussions from that community as well, because it's something that's very relevant, right? And I think it also like scopes down the 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 the, the space of conversations around it so that we can really maximize the, the value out of these exchanges that we will have with that community, which is a great community. I think there are ways that we can go in. I, I do think it has to be a little bit broader than deterministic resolute. Well, maybe it doesn't actually, you, you might have a point there. I was thinking about this PID profiles and attributes section as a part of the next steps for FDO. Do you think that we need to add in additional parts of said PID profiles and attributes? I'll see if I can pull up the actual link to that. Uh, it's somewhere, I'll send it around later. Um, I, there's a document which lays out exactly what that should look like. I think yes. I think yes, because uh, every PID is always a part of the graph. So we can uh, we can have it. Having well, it, uh, there, maybe, maybe that's the closing portion to this talk. It's focused on deterministic resolution, and then it closes out by talking about how each pit goes into said knowledge graph. Yes. It's good saying, idea that there's additional work to do. Is that, I don't yes. know if that makes sense for our conference. But I, I well, think I would keep it as agnostic as possible on all the other aspects, like all the open questions. Yeah. How do we determine what data should go on the network? How do we trace provenance around that data? I think those questions are, 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 okay. are something that we can address in a different paper, different proposal. I think right now it's just about saying there is a method based on network protocols that allows us to have PIDs that have deterministic resolution. Yeah, but the, as a, yes, as a concluding concluding point, I think it's very it's very good idea. And uh, also, uh, just before I forget, uh, uh, Slava, could you please put your email on the chat? Because okay, uh, I, I will do that. Yeah, I include I will include you in our mailing list. Okay, thanks. I think everyone would agree. Okay. Um, do you need any help with the RDA uh, blog post, Andre? I will share it with our Google Documents so very soon, so you will see. And uh, also announce it in the mailing list, so you will place uh, freely your comments, your suggestions, anything you want. I certainly will. All righty. Um, then I'll do the same thing for the FDO abstract once we get that made. I think my calendar is a little packed today, so it should probably be tomorrow. Um, okay. Do we have any other points around these first four topics, or are we good to move on to the next? Uh, well, I think uh, I think from my side, no. Uh, we can do the next, or we can leave them for the next meeting. Uh, what do you think? We can also leave that for the next meeting. We're 10 minutes over. Um, and I don't know that we're necessarily at the right point for um, for what you call it, for going through all of this. Yeah, let's just leave it for the next call. Okay. Uh, sorry, Slava? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add about four points and uh, a discussion about provenance information. So we're building a, a portal called Odyssey. And uh, there is actually aggregator of from, from different data repositories. And currently, we're just working on metadata layer. And the idea that uh, we're going to build semantic search. So what we do, we are just harvesting uh, information from CBS and uh, from different data providers. And, uh, and CBS is Central Bureau of Fun, Fun Statistic from in Netherlands. So uh, uh, there is aggregated uh, copy of uh, portal already available. and. Uh, uh, why I'm saying that, uh, we also have provenance information. So basically, we started to assign uh, uh, identifiers already to 
trackable provenance, but not uh, decentralized. But it will be interesting to investigate if we can actually kind of match to what you're going to do here and also uh, provide decentralized identifiers. I, I will put a link in chat if you're interested. And we uh, recently have also had presentation. Uh, Yes. Yeah. In, in general, I'm very interested in all those things you're you're working on, Slava. I think there's a, you have a lot yeah, of. Yeah, and I also presented semantic search. It's kind of at Harvard. It's uh, they already wanted for all hundreds of repositories <laughs> built yep. on uh, Dataverse technology. Yeah, just give me a second. I will put uh, the link also. Okay. Yeah, last presentation. Yeah. And Slava, if you don't mind me asking, how did you find this group? Oh, uh, so uh, I was actually sent by by our CTO of dance, Wim Hugo. Oh, really? yes. Yes, he yeah. didn't participate today. Yeah, he, he said uh, he, he doesn't have time to, to join today, so I'm basically replacing him. And I can bring you much more folks uh, interested in all this stuff because I'm quite uh, deeply integrated in the centralized community already. That's awesome, man. I'm, I'm so happy to meet you. I think uh, this is, yeah. this is, uh, this is going to be turning out to be a great community. Yes, it would be great. And uh, And now... Probably, probably, uh, so the tasks for now, for example, for me are clear. So I will install uh, Mattermost, uh, share the link, and uh, then uh, probably I will keep it closed. And the registration will be only by emails. So I will use the emails we already have on the mailing list and register all of them in the database. Afterwards, uh, you, probably you will be able to add your own, uh, for example, Google Mails to authenticate yourself on this Mattermost. And uh, I will install the latest available version from the Mattermost GitLab website. Okay, that yeah. works. And you've also got RDA uh, blog post dissemination. And uh, just, a, just a question, does uh, this Sci Foundation or this Sci Labs have uh, GitLab on its own? No, we use, we use GitHub. Ah, okay, okay. Because on the, on Mattermost, there is an integration, they're ready to use integration with GitLab. And uh, just uh, it could be it could be used for, uh, for example, for autom automated publishing of the news about the developments for the, for the future. Uh, just yeah, <laughs> always, always this. Uh, just a second. Just this at Eletra because it's in Italian. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, vision statement draft. What else is on your plate, Andre? Uh, Mattermost, RDA blog post, prospectus review, vision statement, and uh, probably, probably for now that's all. Um, or uh, FDO, FDO participation. Oh yeah, well I'll, I'll put FDO on mine. Um, abstract. By the way, Andre, would you be able to be the one to actually give the presentation at the FDO forum? Um, uh, you're not going to be flying over from the U.S. for it. You can you can put it on on the tasks uh, under the question mark because I should ask uh, ask my authority. Okay, uh, we'll we'll put it off for now. But I wanted to put it out there as a potential. I option. hope I hope that I would be able to participate and to give a presentation. Okay, cool. Um, then I think that's the majority of what we actually had. Um, starting to send the FDL abstract blog post. Do, do, do you want another killing topic about this, about multilinguality? I don't know oh. if it's also in scope of decentralization, but uh, for example, what we do, we are working on, uh, on automatic uh, control vocabulary generation, multilingual. So what we want, we want to produce 
uh, ontology uh, completely uh, filled with hundreds of languages. And LM should do that. And then that's it's also, we, that's so cool, Slava. We've been experimenting with similar things. Actually, we were looking a lot about like automated metadata uh, ontology generation. You know, using okay. things and and things like that. So, yeah, so, man, if you have a solution out of the box for this, I'm like, I'm embracing it. Uh, <laughs> well, well uh, uh, actually, all your crazy ideas. We want <laughs> Slava, yeah, actually, all your crazy uh, ideas. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> actually, my question: if if it's here in the scope or out of the scope, because multilinguality. You can assign uh, to concept uh, DID, and after you can use different language properties to get uh, different translations of the same concept. Yeah, I think it's sadly out of the scope. Right? Yes, okay. I okay, agree, that's... but, but Slava, just but it a... sounds like a great ha rabbit hole to, to, yeah. to dive. Yeah. Uh, just a, a simple question. Uh, do you know Alexandra, uh, Alejandra Gonzalez Beltran? No. Okay, uh, prob because probably she uh, she's, uh, was working on uh, the ontology generation and machine readable mm -hmm. ontologies in the project called Expanse. So okay. yeah, maybe uh, he, she would uh, would be interested in this. If you can, want, can I you, can. Yeah, can you? I can share uh, your email. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, just let me do it now in the chat, or I can send you an email. Yeah, I think by email will be better. Okay, okay. Uh, then, uh, what would you like to uh, discuss on the next meeting? Uh, because uh, once uh, the place of cross resolution and reverse compatibility, uh, will we will we leave it in the list? I think we need Tibor here for that one. Quite frankly, uh, let's leave it in the list. And once we have our shiny new matter, most uh, we can coordinate on that one async actually. Yes. Okay. So that, that is like one action item that would be very valuable for us coming out of the working group efforts is um, essentially both the questions of like, what's the resolution schema? Like how, how do we craft these URLs? Right. That's, that's a question. And the second one, and I, we have we have ways of doing this. We've been experimenting with, but they're probably not the best ways of doing them, right? The second question is everything around, well, we should have cross interoperability with existing infrastructure, meaning data site and cross ref to some degree in doi.org. So we should be able to still mint a DOI, right? And what you have, the way we're naively thinking about it, right? Naively thinking about it is that you can mint a DOI and then we take that DOI that's been minted, let's say using the data site API, and we use that DOI as the root of the uh, um, resolution schema to the IPLD DAG, right? And so essentially that means you could have a DOI and you resolve that DOI and it would allow you to, to address any linked data within that DAG, right? So you could start having things like DOI slash dataset slash measurements dot one, right? For example, right? So it's like a single DOI because they're expensive to create, right? A single DOI can map not an arbitrary long, not an arbitrary amount of information, but a pretty large amount of information before we run into scaling issues. So then uh, hundreds of thousands of digital objects, right? And uh, the side effect of that is that we have that infrastructural cross compatibility, which will be very important for adoption. And the advantage of this is that we essentially, we keep reusing an existing standard where right? we use the existing DOI standard. And so we are not introducing like a new standard of PID We're introducing a new PID technology, which I think is really the, the, the best angle to go about it, right? Um, that we're currently thinking about where, where we're in our minds, right? So like having a, a discussions around that and informed opinions about what is the best way to go forward with this would be very valuable for us because we would immediately implement it at a at the network protocol level, right? But but I think uh, based on what you are saying, it's going it's going to be quite difficult because the UI is being assigned to the latest version, and obviously you don't want that if you have uh, different versions of dates and in the date set, right? So you uh, it's possible to use this approach if you're assigning. Your eyes to files in data set, but not to data set itself. Yeah. So, like the way we're thinking about it is assigning the DOI as the root identifier, mm -hmm. right. because we have this concept of root identifier, right? And so, what that means, you'd have a DOI, a single DOI, mm -hmm. and you have 
uh, 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 slash versions, right? You can address any versions of that okay. object, right? Slash whatever resource is linked to it, right? Okay. okay. And what's really cool, Slava, because I know you're interested in this stuff, is like, if you have that, if you have deterministic resolution, you can do things like in my Python IDE, I'm a scientist, I want to get a data set. I type import DOI from DOI fetch data set, right? Yep. That works. And that means I don't need to like go around the web, you know, clicking around. I, it just, it's just there. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's uh, in some, let's say, in some libraries, including the libraries using the IPFS as a, an underlying technology is already implemented. It's not implemented properly, but it is. Yeah, we, we, we patched it up. We got it working. Yes. And Slava, I'm putting links to back all of this stuff up in the chat um, so you can see the uh, way that we're handling this DPID um, and a replit link for actually querying that data via the API if you're curious. Um, yeah, it's always good yeah. to have this information. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, yes. Uh, perhaps, perhaps in some time, I I also need to leave. So I would indicate that uh, the other points we will move to the next meeting. And uh, uh, would you agree to plan it uh, in the next uh, two weeks on twenty six of uh, of December? Um, let's not do it on Christmas Day. Uh, uh, yes, I will make that request. Why don't we push this one to early January? Yes, it's because much like to say it because I do love these calls. Yes, because uh, for me, I I don't know about Slava, but for me, the Christmas is the uh, seventh of January. Oh, um, really? Yes, it's an yep. Orthodox Christmas. Uh, okay, uh, I can I confirm. Don't... My wife is uh, from Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, then, what do we want to do about that? I, you know, I, I don't have to be here for this call. You can just have it if you want. I mean, well, third of January is pretty good. No, something like that. Yes, for me, for me too, it works. We can do on the third, third of January. That works. Yes. Yes, for me too. Yep. Slava. And yes, you should work for me. Are you honest? Okay. Yeah, January is okay. I'm also celebrating Christmas. My my kids are Dutch, so. <laughs> Jonas, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, that could work. Okay, okay. The, so the let's say the estimated data uh, we can uh, we can keep the third of uh, January right now, and uh, the same plan. Then we would uh, would agree on the matter most once I will install it. Okay. That works, um, and I'll be the one to send out the Zoom on this one, and we'll do all the administrative details and everything, but it'll be easier for me to handle meeting scheduling if I'm going to be the one uploading to cloud in the future. Is that okay with you? Or uploading to YouTube, excuse me. Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, I will share uh, I will share this recording uh, using IPFS almost immediately. Uh, which YouTube channel are we sh sharing this on, on the... Foundation YouTube channel? What's the... Yeah, Foundation YouTube channel. Okay. I've already got a playlist for the DPID oh. working group on there, and okay. I'm going to consolidate all the past meetings. And would you mind, yeah, and would you mind me to prepare also, because I have a possibility, to prepare also the, the subtitles, so I will integrate it directly into the file. Yeah, that would be perfect. That's okay. Good. Okay, so I will do. All right. Okay, so... It seems now, now it's for me, it's time to leave. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, it was a pleasure uh, meeting all these new faces today. Thank you for joining the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for participation. And see you next time. See you. Okay. See you. Bye-bye.